The NTSB just released their preliminary report on the T6 crash in Reno, and I made some animations here over the past week or so, kind of going through what their findings were. So I wanted to share that with you guys. So this is my first time ever making animations like this, so let me know if you like the format. Now the first thing I wanted to kind of go through was circuits. So the first thing to note is that this didn't happen during the actual races. This happened afterwards while they were collecting the airplanes. It happened in the circuit. And because of that, I kind of want to go through a little bit how circuits work, especially at Reno. Um, I'm going to try to remember to call them patterns. Uh, in Canada, we call them circuits, but uh, just know that they're basically interchangeable. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons why we fly the pattern, and one of the reasons that's particularly relevant to this case is it, it's around communication. Uh, you don't have to tell people a whole bunch of information about where you are. You don't have to say, I'm uh, 500 meters north of the runway, uh, heading east. You can just say, I'm downwind left hand for runway 08. And that should give people a pretty good idea of where you are. Uh, it makes communication a lot easier so that you're not cluttering up the airway. So the pattern is often used as kind of a communication aid uh, as, much as, as much as it does other things. But one thing to note is not all the patterns are the same. Uh, for instance, a jet isn't gonna fly in very close to the airport like you would in, say, a 172. Uh, whereas 172, if you, they try to do a very wide pattern like a jet would, uh, you know, they'll be there all day. So not all patterns are kind of following the same path along the ground. Now, because the pattern is so important for communication, I'm gonna play back the actual radio audio uh, in real time as we heard it on the ground. And if you wanna play along at home, uh, close your eyes and kind of think where these planes are as you hear the communication. And I'm gonna put some visuals up on screen uh, showing where I think they would be if everyone was flying a very similar pattern. So I'm gonna play that now for you. One four, down with the beam. Race down with the base gear. Race five zero down on the beam behind eight eight. Five zero. Now for those of you playing at home with your eyes closed, think where are those planes right now? Tell me where number 14 is and tell me where number six specifically are because those are the two accident planes. And if you guessed here, this is where I would imagine they would be. Now the NTSB report has a few different pieces of evidence that they're publishing uh, in this particular report. And uh, there's witnesses on the ground that were mentioning where they believed uh, race number 14 and number six were and where they were coming from. They noted uh, rather oddly that they were all at 300 feet. Uh, usually in the pattern, at, at the end of downwind, usually you're kind of a, a thousand feet, uh, but obviously this is a little bit different situation and um, we've all in training done 500 foot circuits as well, 500 foot patterns as well. Now the other witness they quoted was actually race number 66, uh, Gunslinger, who was flying, uh, it seems to be above them, uh, because he lost sight of race number six, six cat, underneath him, underneath his left wing. They also reviewed the recorded audio from the radios, and uh, that might be from the, the audio I, I submitted to them, uh, which is the audio I'm actually gonna play for you and, and, and have played for you. Now we're gonna talk more about the specifics in the report in a minute, but I'm gonna play back another visualization I did of just Baron's Revenge and Six Cat uh, according to where they are in the report. The pink plane, that's gonna be Six Cat, and the blue one's gonna be Baron's Revenge. And I've tried to synchronize this the best I can with the radio transmissions and uh, where they might approximately be. One four, down with the beam. Behind 
So this animation kind of reveals how far north Baron's Revenge would have had to have been uh, to, to make the turn where he did. And this kind of reveals something that I, I was noticing all throughout the week. Most different planes fly kind of different circuits. They tend to turn downwind and tend to turn base in the same place, but different planes would have wider bases or more narrow bases. Uh, some would have be, be flying a lot closer in on downwind versus a lot further out. Uh, they weren't terribly far out. Like this was definitely an outlier, but they weren't all flying down the exact same path. Obviously slow planes like the T6s would generally tend to be flying in closer and guys like the jets would fly quite a bit further out, uh, obviously because they, they need a lot more, more distance in it for maneuvering. Now specifically in the report, uh, race number 66 Gunslinger uh, was flying, um, it seems to be at a higher altitude than the, than the accident aircraft. And he mentioned that he saw Baron's Revenge uh, flying much further north than he normally did and the plane flew across his, his uh, cowling. And I'm, I'm showing you that footage right now of that visualization of, of what that might have looked like from his perspective. He also noted that he lost sight of Six Cat underneath his left wing. And, uh, and then the next time he saw Baron's Revenge, it was just where he expected it to be, but without anything uh, behind the passenger seat. So uh, it had, the impact had already taken place. So presumably somewhere underneath him. So the next clips I'm showing you here are video from my perspective. So this is kind of what I would have seen. Now I didn't look up until the very last second until literally it had just happened, but I just barely missed it. So it's kind of what, what I saw there. From the south, there was another group that was along the fence line as well. And there's actually some photos taken from uh, where they were for their south. And I might, I might put one of those here in the video here as well. So if you don't want to see that photo, you know, look away. Uh, but then you probably didn't click on the video. Um, so this is probably kind of what they saw at that time uh, with the two planes coming together there. Now the last shots I'm going to show you is kind of a composite of what would have been seen probably on board from Six Cat and Baron's Revenge, uh, as well as kind of an overhead shot of, of what's, uh, what's about to happen, as well as I'm going to re-show you the, uh, the, the path that they would have been taking uh, from the visualization and all that synchronized here. Now, before we go, I want to kind of talk about some of the takeaways from this this accident. And I think there's three main takeaways. The first is kind of, I want to mirror Blanco Lirio, uh, Juan Brown. He mentioned specifically in his video that there wasn't a, a long cool down period. Uh, and a lot of these races, uh, there's usually a significant cool down period where they take some time, uh, they climb up some altitude and that's to cool both the plane down as well as themselves down. Uh, they'll have a lot of adrenaline and a lot of endorphins running. They've been just flying so close to somebody else for so long, they might just need that cool down time so they can be making better decisions. In this particular race, it looks like there wasn't a very long cool down period, if, if at all. Uh, the next one is, uh, I did talk about how circuits can be different in for different situations, but it seems to be that, especially in like the T6s where all the planes are effectively the same, and they should be flying uh, kind of uh, almost a defined pattern and not kind of deviating all over the place so that they know where each other is. And the last thing is, you know, we, we talk about the Swiss cheese model. No accident is just one thing. It, it's a, it's a, a, a confluence of several things all happening together. One of the things that's kind of reasonably noteworthy is that there doesn't seem to be ADS-B on on a lot of the a lot of the race planes, and that makes sense in a race when you know you're you're going to be right next to somebody. You you don't necessarily want ADS-B screaming at you saying you know somebody's right next to you, especially because ADS-B is nowhere near accurate enough for for race avoidance. Uh, we use a different device in, in soaring called the Power Farm because it is much more accurate for for the type of flying we're doing. ADS-B just simply was never designed with racing in mind. Perhaps that's something that if it was turned off for the races and then turned on while recovering the aircraft, it could help uh, avoid something like this. Uh, it's obviously no silver bullet. And that's why we call it the Swiss cheese model because it's, it's no individual one thing. Everything's gotta go wrong. And if you add one extra piece on there, there's one 
more opportunity that the holes don't align and that you don't have an accident. And, and as we know, see and avoid just doesn't work. It's, it's over and over again. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be working. So I spent the better part of the past couple weeks getting this technology to work and I'm probably gonna take this and apply it to future videos as well uh, because I can use this for all kinds of visualizations. So let me know in the comments below or leave a like if you, if you like the visualization aspect of this and uh, I will see you in the next one.